Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Andrea Fosch Knight, and uh, I am a member of the jury, and it is my very great pleasure today to present the 2016 Canadian Jewish Literary Award for Fiction to author Sigal Samuel for her remarkable first novel, The Mystics of My Land. As a reader, as a juror, it is always exciting to celebrate the work of a young author at the very beginning of her writing career. And there is so much to celebrate in this book. It is set in the wonderfully varied and vibrant neighborhood that is Montreal's Mile End. It is a book that is not only rich in characters, but rich in ideas and the effect that grappling with those complex ideas and beliefs can have on everyday life. As if it were not enough, Sigal Samuel gives us still more in The Mystics of My Land. And this is a personal note, although it's one shared by the jury. From the very first page, what captivated me was the thought, this is an author who loves language, who revels in the sheer joy of language, and we are so lucky that she has shared this with us. So on behalf of the jury, Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sigal Samuel. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much to everyone behind this event, from the organizers to the jury, and to all of you for being here. It's really exciting to see you all here. Um, as Andreas said, uh, my novel, The Mystics of My Land, this is actually the Canadian cover, that's the American one, um, is, um, it's set in Montreal's neighborhood of My Land, which some of you may be familiar with. If you are, you know that it's a really quirky combination of Hasidic Jews and hipsters, among, among many others. And uh, if you're familiar with the neighborhood, you'll recognize some of the street names in the little excerpt that I'm about to read to you. But before I read it, um, I just wanted to say that this is a book about Kabbalah, about a family becoming dangerously obsessed with the idea of climbing the Kabbalah's tree of life. And as I've been touring with this book the past year, a lot of people seem to find it odd that a young woman has written a book about Kabbalistic imagery and ideas, and um, they find it especially odd because there's this taboo in Judaism about women and young people in general studying Kabbalistic texts, which you might be familiar with. Um, and they asked me how I came to write this book, and the answer is very simple. Like Anne, I was inspired by my dad. Um, he was a professor of Jewish mysticism in Montreal. And even though I was raised in the Orthodox world um, where girls are really not encouraged, or in fact discouraged from studying Kabbalah. My dad uh, never gave me any idea that there was anything I couldn't or shouldn't study, and he was very adamant that I should have equal access to the whole Jewish literary tradition. So every day I had two curricula. I would go to an Orthodox school, have that entire curriculum, and then I would come home at the end of a long school day and the second curriculum would begin, which would be, yeah, fun. What kid doesn't like going to school twice every day? Um, the second curriculum would be sitting with my dad around the dining room table, reading from the Zohar, reading Isaac Luria. And that started when I was about eight or nine years old and continues very much to this day. Just last week we were studying. Um, and so even though he couldn't be here today, I just wanted to say thank you to my dad. Um, and a little shout out to all the the dads um, and parents who inspire their, um, their kids, especially their daughters, and uh, make them believe that there's nothing they can't write about. So the little excerpt I'm going to read to you is from the dad's section of the book. The book is written in four different voices. There's the dad, the daughter, the son, and finally from the perspective of the neighborhood, my land itself. Uh, this little section is from the father, David's voice. He has just suffered a heart attack and been diagnosed with a very unusual heart murmur. And he is coming to believe that this murmur is actually God speaking to him. 
which is very inconvenient because he's an atheist. I suddenly needed to go for a run. I knew this would be anathema to Dr. Singh and to Val and to my kids and to whatever specter shadow of their dearly departed mom they liked to imagine might still be watching over me from above, but. Ever since Miriam's death, I'd been exercising twice a week, every week, without fail. Eager to finally shed the physical wimpiness associated with yeshiva culture, I'd become acquainted with the perverse pleasures, the masochism really, of long distance running. Now, because I wasn't about to let one little heart attack undo over a decade's worth of training, I dug out my t-shirt, jogging pants, and running shoes and snuck out of the house on tiptoes. The morning sun was high up in a cloudless sky, glinting off the brick row houses, wrought iron gates, and balconies, sparkling in the dewy grass of their tiny front yards. The young professionals had already left for work. The twisting staircases they'd painted in lively purples and greens and oranges were free of the bicycles that usually lay propped against the rails. In their various yeshivas, the chassids were gathered for morning prayers, beating their breasts during the silent devotion, or bouncing on the balls of their feet as they sang, holy, 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 etc. I raced along the tree-lined street in a tunnel of green light, then turned onto Bernard. Pulse pounding, I sped past the boutiques and bakeries, and was just beginning to get an enjoyable endorphin rush going when all of a sudden I heard it again, the odd music, the oddly linguistic music. My heart murmur was audible now. I could hear it thrumming. I could hear it almost saying. Saying what? At that instant, I had the kind of intuition generally enjoyed only from that rearview mirror known as hindsight. Now, right now, before it was too late, was the time to flick this idea away from me, nip it in the bud. It was absurd, the thought of an internal organ speaking in human words that is not what is meant by body language. Yet instead of slowing down to silence it, I sped up. My heart rate accelerated, blood was pounding in my ears. My knees ached, my shins cried out for respite. I pressed on, I needed to be sure. Monosyllabic? No, definitely disyllabic. A vowel followed by a consonant followed by another vowel? It was unclear, I gathered speed, my lungs shriveled, my brain whined, but now at last I could make out the first syllable. Ah. Uh, the second syllable was more elusive, but that only made me want to hear it more. Nothing had ever seemed more vital. Was it an N or perhaps an M? It might have been a Y, but then again, it could just as easily have been an L. Picking up still more speed, I cranked up the volume of my heart. But I took an unfortunate turn. Instead of darting along one of the neighborhood's deserted back alleys, I made the mistake of bolting down Duroche. Morning prayers were over, chassids flooded the street, and I was drowning in a sea of fur-trimmed hats and black satin coats. Dark beards and scrawny shoulders pushed past, while the gazes of their owners slid right through me. I felt, for a moment, the loneliness of the invisible. And they were loud, so loud, calling to each other in a tumult of Yiddish and Hebrew in the vulgar vox populi of the European shtetl. Beginning on the steps of the synagogue and slowly but surely filling the entire street, a thousand separate cries of, good Shabbos, rang out and joined forces to become an inescapable wall of sound. I couldn't hear what my heart had been trying so hard to tell me. Not for the first time, I experienced a bitter surge of hatred for this particular type of worshiper, whose shrill holiness dominated the bandwidth of religious sensibility, silencing stiller, smaller voices until the only signals that were audible were those spoken in the first person plural, in the cultish key of we. Thank you.